I collapsed. I passed out. Everything went black. But the next moment flash that I had in that moment was I was shooting through the sky. And I was th this ball, I could see this globe that I was heading towards. I knew where I was going. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going there. And then it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, oh, that's such a big place. How am I going to find myself? Is this me too? Is this my reality? Kia ora and welcome back to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. I'm Kirsty Salisbury, the host of your show. And today I'm joined by Amira Hall. She's a near-death experiencer, a psychic medium, a medical intuitive, and an author. Amira's near-death experience took place while she was traveling in Egypt, and it's changed everything upon her return. She is the author of six books, including Manifesting Miracles 101 and The Essential Guide to Spiritual Awakening. And I'm really looking forward to learning more about her journey in today's conversation. So Amira Hall, welcome to Let's Talk Near Death. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Where do we start with your journey? Where does your near-death story start? Well, that's a great, very specific question. Thanks a lot for that, because I've been on a spiritual awakening journey for a very long time. But, you know, I was I had a really cushy tech job. It was about 25 years ago. I was living in San Diego, California. And I had a good family relations. And, you know, my career looked so bright, you had to wear sunglasses, you know. <laughs> and and then uh, there was something missing. It felt like there were, I had a yearning for something. And I kept feeling this nudge to go to Egypt. So I launched myself on a spiritual pilgrimage. I went with a small group. We had a marvelous two weeks time there in Egypt. Uh, there was many several mystical experiences that I'm happy to share along the way. And I extended my stay and I went to the um, Luxor right outside the Valley of the Kings where all the major tombs have been discovered, King Tut, so just to name one. And I was purchasing uh, small beads um, for my jewelry that I was designing. And these were antiquities. And what happened was not something that I was proud of, and I haven't shared for years and years and years, like 25 years now, because it was an embarrassment to me. I felt, um, yeah, just humiliated by sharing it with a few people that I did. So here's what happened. When you buy something in Egypt, it's not just a thank you and you pay for what your goods are. Because I knew the people, they took me into the factory where they were, where they found these treasures. And um, it's an exchange. You sit, you visit, you chat, you get to know, you know, what's your grandmother's name and, you know, kids' mm -hmm. names and showing pictures. And it's quite an exchange. Well, they brought out a joint. Normally, they bring out some Coca-Cola or a cup of tea or some water, but they brought out a joint for me. I said, no, thank you. I'm being so polite and um, respectful. No, no, thank you. And Muhammad, well, my God, if you don't know any Arabs or a Egyptians especially, they get very excitable. And he was raising his hands and he was shouting, it's the best, it's the best. And Oh my gosh, I was feeling intimidated growing up in, in a little bit of a, you know, uh, my dad was a bit aggressive. Um, that really shook me up. And I thought, gee, I'm not being polite. And he is feeling insulted, right? That I've rejected his offer, his gesture. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I, the joint went around, like 10 people showed up. And I maybe had two hits on that joint. And then it was time to get up and leave. Everybody's bounced up and ready to run. Oh. And I couldn't get out of the chair. I was sitting in the only plastic chair in the room because I was the only female. I was the only American. And at that time, it was quite a crisis because a year before, there was a massacre of 34 people just down the road at Queen Hatshepsut Temple. And so these people were highly sensitive to anything happening to an American. And I say that because there were special, I think, agreements between the governments that, you know, we have to be uber protected. So at any rate, I'm standing behind my chair and I'm witnessing everybody's life 
it was like I was seeing 10 life reviews. And then everything seemed like it was in slow motion. And as I'm standing behind myself, I'm going, I'm leaving my body. I'm leaving this life. I don't want to leave. And so I remember holding my hands out thinking, if I could just get some water, if I could just get some water and splash my face, I will stay. But I remember my friend, I must have verbalized something, but I didn't hear it. And he went to the cooler, he got the water, he was walking towards me, and everybody was laughing. And as they walked towards me, I um, got the water, and I remember getting it like six inches from my face, seeing my hands, <laughs> thinking, oh shit, my mascara is going to run. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that was the last thought I had. I collapsed. I passed out. Everything went black. And then the, then I can tell you what, what they told me happened. But the next moment flash that I had in that moment was I was shooting through the sky. I, I, it, I, it was dark and there were lights around me, little lights like stars or a sense of stars. And I kept getting, it was like, I was literally like a, a comet and it was just streaking so fast. And I was th this ball, I could see this globe that I was heading towards. I knew where I was going and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going there. And then it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, oh, that's such a big place. How am I going to find myself? And I wasn't panicked. But then I started hearing, it was almost like the answer came right as I said it, because I got so close, I heard Arabic, but I, I'm like, I don't know what they're saying. I don't know where that is. And then it went, oh, it was like a psychic GPS that goes, do, 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 to find my body where my soul needed to plug back in. And then the next big moment I had struggled with, I uh, when I started to come back into my body, all I could feel was my stomach, my gut ready to explode. And, you know, I've heard from medical teams that, you know, after death, the first thing that goes is your bowels. So mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking that. I was just thinking, holy geez, I need a toilet. And keep in mind, this was back in 1998. This was in the village outside the Valley of the Kings. It was extremely primitive. We're talking mountains and sand and people with donkeys and carts, okay? A few cars, yes, and trucks, but it was really primitive. And um, so I, I, I can't open my eyes and I'm reaching, I'm trying to figure out what's happening to me and what's going on. My head, I'm starting to sense that my head is leaning on the windowsill of a vehicle and, and I'm trying to find my way. And I, I found my friend's arm. I could hear them talking and shouting and speaking in Arabic. There was a lot of excitement. And I just felt total bliss. It, it, I was struggling at the same time trying to get in my body. It was almost like trying to, have you ever put wet clothes on? Oh, after yeah. Swimming? Yeah. <laughs> And it's so creepy, right? It's cold. Yeah. It's awful. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah. it's like the worst thing, right? And trying to put on a wet wetsuit is even harder. You know, yeah. it's shimmying and pulling and strong. That's what it felt like. And it feel, felt like the longest time trying to get into my body. So when I reached out and touched him, I said, I didn't open my eyes yet. And I said, where are you taking me? And he said, something in Arabic. And I couldn't understand that. And then he realized, oh, she doesn't speak Arabic. So he says it and blurts it out, well, to the hospital, you know, and screaming. I'm like, oh dear, that will kill me for sure. Because I'm thinking how primitive it is, right? Mm -hmm. They don't even have kitchens like we have in the West, you know, like they've mm -hmm. got chickens and cats running around on the table and they eat on the, on the dirt floor at the time. And it was a mess. And so I'm thinking, oh, God, I can't go to a hospital. I said, I need a bathroom. So the next bit was they had to carry me up the stairs. I couldn't walk. And I didn't realize I couldn't walk. And get me upstairs to a bathroom and then laying on the bed, recovering, which 
I couldn't walk for about two or three hours and I had to fly home that day from Luxor to Cairo, Cairo to New York, New York, Atlanta, San Diego, 24 hour journey. Mm. And here I am in this bed and they're freaking out because of what happened last year to the, to the, um, something happened to me now. And there was that, uh, massive, uh, what do you call it? Massacre. Mm-hmm. It just, just down the road. They were freaking out because they thought, Oh my God, she, 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 we're going to all go to jail. We're going to literally lose our livelihood and everything will, you know, they were dedicated, desperate to get me healthy and happy. Mm. So there I am in recovery. Um, they kept bringing me juice. They brought me orange, fresh oranges. They brought me water and yogurt. And they had this sense that I was dehydrated. So it's a, that's an interesting note. But what was happening for me immediately is that when I looked at the armoire across the bedroom, I could see the goddess Sekhmet. She's the Egyptian goddess with a lion head and a female body. And having walked through Egypt and having these many mystical experiences and deep meditations for the previous two weeks, I was like, what the hell am I seeing? What is that? Okay, it's. I remember who she is. I couldn't even really remember her name. And then I look outside, there was a small window to my right. There was these um, sheer draperies just fluttering in the wind. The shutters or the window was completely wide open. And I was just thinking, I'm looking out there at the Green Nile Valley and the mountains in the sky. That's real. I am not looking back at this armor. That ain't real. So it was just like, my God, what is happening? Where, you know, and I tried to shut it off. It wouldn't stop. So I just remember laying there and feeling such bliss, such utter love. And the most interesting thing is, as I was sort of in and out of coming into my body still, as I said, I couldn't walk. My friend was wearing a shirt, T-shirt, that said, love is all there is. Hmm. And that was one of the things. So, So fast forward, I had to leave that day. And so there was a slow process of me coming into recovery, getting on the plane. My friend flew with me from Luxor, which he had never flown in an airplane before in his life. And he was petrified. Wow. But he was more concerned about his family and what was going to happen if he didn't mm. make sure I got the hell out of the country. Mm. <laughs> so he escorted me to Cairo. I had some friends waiting for me at the airport. Well, they weren't waiting for me. They were extended their trip too. We happened to be on the same flight. And I asked them, I said, who's this lion goddess with a, fe- with a female body? And they said, oh, that's Sekhmet. She is the healer of healers. She was the patron saint of all the doctors in ancient Egypt. So, oh, that's mm-hmm. interesting. Get on the plane, slept all the way back to New York. Got out of the airplane on the jetway and into the airport. And all the people appeared like walking paper dolls. And all I could feel was this heavy, grief and anger and pain and I was just almost hyperventilating I I was like I don't want to come back here this is a horrible place I'm this is this is just just evil this is just ugly and I was sitting there in Atlanta in New York I was just so frightened I was reading my book so I was like I was and you know this has been 25 years of trying to figure out what happened Mm -hmm. I think I was in both realms or um, coming back into my re-entry, I hit this frequency of of despair. Some people might call it hell. But as I was sitting there, I started to realize, am I living in the land of paper dolls? Is this me too? Can am I, am I is this my reality? So flat, two-dimensional struggling, suffering. Well, I got back to Atlanta uh, from Atlanta to San Diego, and it was the fresh air from the Pacific air that hit me. I think all of a sudden all of that stopped. But I struggled with anger and depression and fear for about nine months. So I went on a journey of what happened. Where did I go? I'm not the same. Something happened. 
So I had enough sense. And as I said in the beginning, I've been on a spiritual journey. I have done classes. I have done spiritual exploration, studying with the, you know, esoteric mystery schools, um, you know, and uh, religious science, unity uh, teachings, uh, the science of thinking and grow rich. I, you know, had a long curiosity of all of these things. But I, nothing made sense to me. And, you know, we didn't have internet back in 98. And there was yeah. really nobody talking about near death. And so as I would go out and just share with a few people, like they'd go, um, that's nice. You had a real trip, didn't you? <laughs> so, it was like, uh, it wasn't a trip. I know I'm different. There, it, it, call it what you want. So I thought I had a heart issue. Because when I, I had smoked pot a few times in my life, and the reason I re refused is it never did anything for me. I'm like, you guys enjoy it if you enjoy it. Give me a light beer. You know, I'd rather mm -hmm. enjoy that. But I, I just wasn't. And so that was the reason I refused it. And also, I had been on a detox for a month prior to that. So my system was highly sensitive. Mm -hmm. And when the yeah. doctor, I, he did a full, you know, comprehensive checks. He said, the only thing that's off me, Amira, is you've got low amino acids. And he told me, he's, and I told him the whole story. He says, you know that more people die of dehydration wow. than a lot of other things. And I didn't know that. And I said, oh, that all makes sense. Um, so we were very concerned there about how we were drinking, what we were drinking. Maybe, you know, there's, there's a good chance that drug knocked me out i had been prepped for a spiritual journey so to speak mm -hmm. and it just took me took me out so what what was so fascinating is that on my journey of finding out what happened where did i go that was my big quest i remember going to the book expo of america in los angeles and i wanted desperately to write my story but i didn't know where to begin i really needed help right i didn't i just sensed it but i didn't know how to go about it and i was shopping for you know a agent or you know a publisher or somebody that would find the story interesting and everybody dismissed me they were like you know go away so i thought okay and <laughs> at the book expo everybody's giving away their books so you've got these, I've got these book bags, and I'm schlepping probably 20 hardcover books, wow. but don't ask me what they were. So I am just dying with all this weight, right? Mm. <laughs> you know how we go to these fairs and we hoard mm. Mm. crap because they're all free. And I'm thinking, oh God, I gotta get a hotel. I had a hotel room, but I'm thinking more than anything, I need a massage. I need a massage. I found this Chinese massage place and i can't even find the place today i don't know if they're in business but i've tried several times i go in there and the guy starts walking on my back and that's when i got my information of where i went and it was funny because the nine months leading up to that i had probably visited a dozen psychics and healers I knew for sure if I went to see a psychologist, they would lock me up and throw away the key. Because this is not a conversation anybody, I mean, most people don't like having this conversation yeah. anyway, yeah, right? right? But can you yeah. imagine, 30, you know, 25 years ago? Uh -huh. So that's how it was. Wow. So what happened as he's walking on your back? You're very brave, by the way. I don't think I'd like that. Um, he's walking on your back. What you said that's when you got the information, you had some understanding. Right. So what happened was immediately it was almost like I melted into this. It was like my form literally melted to like a puddle. And then it sort of created this, this puff of a cloud like you know, energy. And uh, my guide appeared. Uh, I, it was just pure light. It was sort of like an orb or an oval shape and said to me that we were going to go on a tour of the all, but I couldn't stay. And so I'm like, okay. So it was like I got on the wings of a giant bird and this bird took me through multiple dimensions, took me to the first stopping point was a building. 
It was the most perfectly constructed, designed, and I know this sounds stupid, but I can't explain the level of perfection that I stepped into is, I guess, what I'm trying to explain. Mm. And I, I started to understand that this is the form or the realm of creation, our structure, our 3D, and how we see things or how things. So I, I found myself immediately in this boardroom. I was at the head of the table and there were these 12 I couldn't count them, but I'm a, I just got the number. There were 12 beings. They were all dressed identical, and they had these glowing heads. It was like the top of the head lifted up, and there was this glowing light at the top, and these streams of light just streamed from their heads into mine. And the message was, you can know anything you need to know when you need to know it. Wow. Overwhelming. Then I was like, whoop, immediately transported into this doorway it was it was a giant hallway with a massive door and there were doors on either side for as long as i could see and my guide said to me you can choose whatever door you want to enter but you can't stay so i'm like okay yeah okay no big deal <laughs> so i go into the first door to my right it was a gold door i stepped in through that door, because yeah, I didn't open a door. I just literally went through it. It was like immediately I was in this space. And it, the best I can describe this was a moving kaleidoscope of color and patterns. Mm. And I was in this space and I remember saying in my mind, where am I? And the voice my guide said, this is the fabric of all creation. This is love. I felt as if I was cocooned in a mother's womb, safe and warm and protected, just content, blissful. That those were the feelings I had. Well, like no worries, no, no busyness, nothing, no other thoughts. Mm. And then boom, I was hurled out of that, and I'm like, that's rude. <laughs> <laughs> it was so abrupt. It was just like, oh, that's just mean. And, you know, and it was like, well, you know, Amira, they told you you couldn't stay. So, mm. you know, I just sort of saunter across directly across from where I came out. And there was what I see as a pink door. So I walk through this door. Walk. I didn't walk. I went through it, literally. And it was this opaque, emerald-like energy. It was like stepping inside of an emerald that was crystal clear. And almost immediately, I had a life review. And my life review showed me how my emotions all through my life, it was almost like it was on a timeline, showing me where all the blips were that created illness, disease, dysfunction, and destruction. And that my job was to um, learn how to heal myself by clearing my emotions. But more than that, detoxing. It was, it was more of an overall message of detoxing. I took it immediately as physical detox, but the emotional detox and the spiritual detox or the mental detox is all part of it to understand, you know, our role here in this life. I learned in that space, and that's where I didn't have the words at the time. And partly that's perhaps why I couldn't verbalize it for so long. Only when I came across Deepak Chopra's book about quantum physics, I started to understand what was happening to me. Because I was starting, when I came back, I could see energy. And I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, articulate it. I couldn't say, well, well, and now I just say that it's just energy. I can see it. But I could see where the blocks were and I could move them. And so I started my journey to heal. That's what I had to do. I started have to clear the debris, the lifelong, this lifetime and other lifetimes. So it was a gradual process of discovery and, and releasing. But to recognize that everything is energy. I'm energy, 
Mm. And that my thoughts are creating, my emotions are creating. And the true path to healing and manifestation or anything that I want is simply clearing that. And it allows me to come into alignment with the truth and all the purity that I am, which is love. And so it's a hard one. It's a hard path in terms of remembering that message of being love and I am love. Because when we're in the 3D aspect of our being, we're separated from that mental idea or that spiritual knowingness. Mm. So it's a constant. I mean, there were there were times and not years, but there were moments in time where, you know, I resisted and not didn't want to be here. As a sensitive, as an empath, my entire life, I didn't realize that depression and anxiety was simply stuck energy. Mm. And that, you know, going to the other side and then being here and struggling with depression or the anxiety, just like, shit, get me out of here. I want, I don't want any part of this. I want, I, let me go home. You know, this is, you know, is it time yet? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, um, more and more, I feel grateful that I've got words and I can share and hopefully inspire others yeah. to embrace the mysteries of who they are and yeah. get excited about that and discover the magic and the miracles that we can create. As, as, as creators, we are here to do that, to mm-hmm. manifest everything that's in our heart. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you, Amira. I can, you know, you've shared your story and I can just be, I can feel it. I'm so aware of everything that went on around the stuff that you've shared about the the journey you must have been on personally, the emotional journey, the physical journey. There's so much more to what you've shared with us. And yet there's already so much there. So I'm sitting here just feeling like, wow, this is amazing. I'm very aware. <laughs> I'm of sorry. To, I'm sorry to knock you over. Almost, it it it's a, it, it is a lot to take in. But I think I've been back to Egypt now 13 times. I just 13. came back. September. Yeah, lucky 13. Oh wow. Um, okay. The mysteries, the transformation alone that occurs walking that ground, and I, and I really do believe that it was almost probably some past life activity that was, you know, sort of bubbling up and, uh, oh, yes, remembering who I am. And then I have fallen away in this lifetime. And so a big part of that was, yes, walking your talk, stepping into your power, you know, being able to heal and manifest. And I say those words over and over and over because the true nature of who we are as energy is to manifest. Mm. That's it. Mm. Yeah. So we got to get clear. What is it that we want to create? Because I think what's happening here on the planet now, and this, I hope this isn't too esoteric for your community, but honestly, I'm seeing the way we create is shifting and it's getting easier. That's the beauty of all of what's happening here spiritually is we're awakening. The masses are awakening. Many souls are departing. And mm-hmm. I've been telling my clients for probably a good 10 years now, there's going to be a mass exodus. And mm-hmm. I did not how or what, and we're starting to see it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and there will be more to come because whatever, I don't want to get into that. But, you know, I guess all of this has also helped prepare me mm-hmm. to, you know, steer others to healing and or support to understanding mm-hmm. that there's nothing to fear. It is incredibly mm. beautiful. The hell was when I came back to JFK. <laughs> That's when it started, you know? Yeah. So do you still see people as 2D? Like the I think you called them paper dolls. Yeah, walking paper dolls. No, I don't see people like that. And honestly, I don't go around trying to see people. <laughs> I could be sitting next to somebody having a glass of wine or sitting standing in the grocery store. I purposefully tr- try to turn it off. Yeah. But if I'm in conversation with somebody, I might just, you know, pick something up and, oh, gee, you know, uh, oh, I can't think of anything right off because I'm channeling the whole um, experience. But things will just come out of my in my conversation and they're just like, oh, yeah, actually, that did that did happen, you know. Yeah. And so um, 
like I was talking with a client earlier today and she said, I said, did you have some questions? She goes, no, no, I don't. And then about five minutes later, she says, oh yeah, could you have a look at my doggy? Because he's all of a sudden got this thing on his back and got some pain in, in his legs. And I said, well, I see stuff around his ears. And she goes, oh, he's deaf. Oh, and, wow. you know, so I just yeah. will notice something or see something. And it's just, I sometimes I don't even know I'm seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so, and quite honestly, I believe everybody does that. Now I mm. might have a heightened awareness mm. or, or a trust level to just have the conversation to open it up to the next thing. But a lot of times we get these thoughts. We don't even know that it is correct. Mm. Mm. It's about tuning in as well, isn't it? We're all attuned well, and, to different and see, levels that's... and frequencies. Yeah. You're most right. Um, I grew up in a Catholic family in Canada, northern Canada, and I didn't get validation for my spiritual or psychic abilities as a sensitive mm -hmm. little girl. And it was always dismissed or negated. And whenever I'd say something, I was just a troublemaker. That's how I got labeled. So you start to turn off your light, you stop using your gifts. And that's mm -hmm. really what happened. I was embarrassed. Uh, to say that I could see things or know things. And mm -hmm. it it created it's really hard dating because <laughs> <laughs> you can see something, you know, and they'll go, no, that's not true. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, da -dum -da -dum -da -dum. and <laughs> I knew things. And I, sometimes I don't know how I know. Yeah. But yeah. I think after the NDE, I could no longer deny it. As I said, I was had a cushy tech job. My career looked great. I came back thinking, okay, I'm going to get back in the saddle. Everything's good after I started getting on my healing path. I interviewed, and I was in a six-figure income back then, and I would interview three times and get rejected. And I interviewed three different companies three different mm -hmm. times for very high-level jobs. And I wasn't selected. and. That's devastating. But I finally, finally surrendered and said, okay, I guess that's not the path. Mm. And by then I was playing around with coffee grounds. And so I um, sort of picked that up in the Middle East. And I, I went one day to get my organic vegetables at the market. There was, the kids were having a coffee. Uh, kids were going. the kids were doing a high school kids were doing a car wash and I thought oh yeah I'll get the kids to wash my car so I pulled in yeah. while they're washing my car I get out and oh, go for a coffee and the coffee shop is absolutely dead it's a busy Saturday morning everywhere's bustling but this dumb coffee shop I'm like well this is strange um looks like you guys could use some help and so I said to them you know, I read coffee grounds. Would you like to do some special events here? And I'll just come to read coffee. Oh, they said, that's a great idea. Why don't you? And so I'm like, get out back in my car. And I mean, what the hell was that? Where did that come from? Well, and then I heard it was so clear and so loud. It was almost like a voice through my radio that said, now go out and get six more just like that. <laughs> So as a dutiful little Catholic girl, I went out and I, I I charted out these coffee shops and I went and I, you know, prospected them all and set up my little strategy and I started reading coffee grounds. People are saying to me, how can you see that in that pile of mud? Yeah. <laughs> and then I had to fess up that I was actually seeing their energy, their aura, and I was reading it through the coffee grounds or using it as the medium. And that translated to me teaching people how to manage their energy and to streamline their energy to create more of what they want. As we do that, yes, our spiritual abilities, our innate, preordained, pre-programmed abilities will start to show up. So as I said, everybody is psychic. Everybody's mm -hmm. picking stuff up. Mm -hmm. They may not... No, it like a radio is blasting all the signals for all the stations. You just have to tune into your specific channel to see your mm. country music or jazz or rock and roll. What that looks like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I the, want to backtrack the, 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 a little bit. The, the waves are being broadcasted all the time, everywhere. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. and it's it's tapping into them. I just want to backtrack a little bit. Please. I've got this visual. Uh, when you were talking, you were in the car, you were outside your body, and you asked me, have you ever put on wet clothes? The first thing that popped to my head actually was a wetsuit because I quite often wear a wetsuit for different water sports and things that I do. I'm not very good at them. I'm actually afraid of the water, but I keep pushing myself <laughs> out there. So I've got a wetsuit, and it is awful to put on a wet, cold wetsuit. But you're there, you're in the back of the car, and I'm visually... Oh, I'm not in the back of the car. Let me paint the picture. Okay. So they load me up. Apparently, my body uh, went hard, stiffened. Mm. I fell out of the only chair. I'm there on the ground. They grabbed me under the arms, dro- dragged me out of the shop, and they were yelling my name at the top of their lungs. It was like a, a church bell through all of the village. It was, ah, oh, there screaming at me he was pounding my chest with all his might I call that Egyptian CPR (laughs) and so then they they loaded me into the passenger side of a pickup truck so this is a taxi in urban village Egypt back then so it's a pickup truck the the cat the um bed has got benches on this either side. So they pick people up, they're going down the road, people just jump in the back and mm-hmm. they'll move along, right? And they'll give give the driver a couple pounds as they get out. So there I am, I'm propped up with my head out the window. They're heading down the road trying to take me to a hospital. Meanwhile, I mean, that's their idea of giving me oxygen, right? Head out the window. And Mm -hmm. so that was it. And until I heard the voices. So from the time I collapsed, they dragged me out. They had to hail this truck or call them from somewhere. So that time frame to us, I don't know how long we'd been on the road, but they had to take me. So then the next crisis was, I I need a bathroom. And they're Mm -hmm. flipping out like, oh, my God, because back then there were no Western toilets. Mm -hmm. And there's a rule that a man can't be with a woman in a private place like that. Mm, I can't mm. stand up. So what are they going to do? They've got these holes in the ground, right, for the feet. (laughs) And I'm supposed to stand up and do my business. How is this? This was a crisis on crisis. That's just awful. (laughs) And and meanwhile, they're thinking, oh, we're going to jail. Our lives are over. Something's happened to this America. The government's going to, and believe me, when they throw you in jail, there's no coming out. There's no call to a lawyer. Oh, my so God. it was, it was like multifaceted, stressful, you know, bombardment of what do we do now? Oh my God. You know, this yeah. is all I wanted was a bathroom. I was completely at bliss. I was completely oblivious. And um, for that whole time, I was just in such utter peace. Mm. And mm. there were a lot of other downloads and things happening. It was hard. Honestly, I was just doing everything I could to come back. Come back. What what where was I? I I think it took me that amount of time, the nine months, 12 months, to really bring myself back. Mm. So that was my question right there was you were trying so hard to get back into this body, putting on the wet wetsuit. You were trying so hard to return. Did you feel like you had any choice? Was there free will that you could maybe not return? Were you aware what you were returning to? I just felt total bliss, even though I struggled putting on the wetsuit. But you wanted to return. You wanted to put that wetsuit on. No, I was here. I was here. And at that moment, there wasn't any regret or, 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 you know, no, I I was just pure love. I, I just felt pure lightness, pure light. Yeah. Except the the dawning on me of putting on this wetsuit i'm like this must be what it's like to be born like holy crap did i sign up for this mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember signing up for that but that part coming down the birth canal what's that like is that like a death a death of our spirit coming into a mm. new form yeah who knows there are people out there with uh pre-birth memories remember doing that and I did a regression one time I think I've shared this on the show before I did a life between lives regression and she tried to take me back to my birth moment in the birth canal coming out but actually I refused I was saying no I'm not going back there so I don't know whether it was because it was quite full-on I don't think my birth was 
I think it was straightforward, but I did not want to go back to that point, which was, I found you know, that so fascinating. In my advanced trainings, I work with people and we don't do past life regression. We literally do conscious time travel. I guess you could say time travel. We go mm. between lives, but we look along our timeline and, and what you're describing is a perfect example of energy, whether it's the parents, whether it's your souls, uh, like just a, an energy block. I try not to label it. Mm. We can identify it, but labeling it sort of locks it in. So mm. we can remove those energies because some of that resistance actually can interfere with maybe how easy or difficult you make your life. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So all of these things factor in and from previous lifetimes too. Uh-huh. And so we can we can explore and we can extract information. Sometimes what happens is people's past lives are like pushing in. It's almost like an overlay or a filter that's budging over. So a person is stuck between trying to finish karma and it's interfering, like let's say a bad relationship. They they keep going back to this dead end thing job or a relationship and they keep trying to fix it well what they're tr not realizing is they met this person from another life they're remembering each other they had to finish the karma but i'm able to help them heal and end the karma so that they can just be here now and live this karma mm. so it can be very complicated to talk about quantum physics and the overlay oh, and yeah. the interconnection and you know what? It just all makes sense to me. Not that I'm supposed to make sense of it. You know, it's just one of those things. It's like ordered chaos. It's just like, yeah. get over it. You're not going to figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. I love that point that you've raised about the karma and we're living this lifetime, but we're trying to resolve previous karma. And what if there's multiple lifetimes involved in that? We've got different karmas from different life. You know, so many questions. It's where we could go down so many pathways and spend 600 hours there. You know, there's just yeah, so many oh yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you talked at one point about how, I can't quote you perfectly, but you were talking about how anxiety and depression, I think you were saying, were simply energy blocks. Now, this yes. is something that's very relevant for, for myself, for many people I know, for many of our listeners. We've, I think most people have experienced a degree of either depression or some kind of anxiety phase in their life. You're saying it's energy blocks. How do we clear these? Well, that's a big question. Um, let me just paint a <laughs> picture for you. This uh, client of mine, her name is Donna, and her son committed suicide last year, last summer. And when Donna came to me, she was really, really struggling, you know, as any parent does or any and for any of us losing somebody that we love in our lives. And I've been there myself. And so what I do is I just start, how can I say, I, I just start clearing the energy. If you could see fingerprints on a window, mm -hmm. oh, you go, oh, I can see it when I'm looking at this angle. If I look straight here, I can't see anything, right? So you know that fingerprints there, you've got a rag, you've got the what you can do to clear and remove the block or the fingerprint. That's what I do. Because I can see in places that you can't, I can see that foreign energy. A lot of times it's not your energy. That's amazing, isn't it? To know that that depression isn't even you. How about that? I mean, mm. yay. Um, we can, you know, sometimes it's our own emotions or uh, regrets or just an attitude that we just want to hold on to our position. And mm. that can build and build and build and fester just like any wound. But when we can just go, I want to clear it out and move on, it's like driving the car through a car wash. Do you think about all the crap that you left behind? You just think about that shiny yeah, new sparkling yeah. car on the other side. And that's where Dawn is at today after that. And she's not only that, she started communicating with her son. She can go to work and not have to put on a fake face of, of oh, yeah, I'm going to be doing okay. Yeah. She is you know, engaging, she's amused, she's cracking jokes, and she's just finding her light again. Yeah. And now it's not like he's gone anywhere. She's starting to have a growing connection with him. So whether it's a relationship, whether it's our kids or our parents or, you know, uh, struggling with our careers, 
all of those things, whatever we're fearing, or um, let's say we have an argument or a conversation with somebody at work, and that just got, oh, I can't get over this. It bugs me. It just, you know, it's, it's, there's something about you that's taking it personal or has taken on that foreign energy, almost like a magnet got stuck. Mm. And when we can do simple practice, I teach what I call quantum energy tools. They're simple tools. And number one tool that all of us need to learn and practice and practice and practice is called grounding. Mm. You may have heard of that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just go through that for listeners who haven't heard the concept of grounding? Yeah. Yeah. Well, for one, just imagine yourself wherever you are sitting or driving or I don't know, washing dishes. You just imagine from the base of your spine to the center of the earth, a cord or a lighting, lightning rod or a beam mm. or a monkey's tail, you know, for kids. <laughs> my, my students used to teach their That's kids cool. like, okay, we got to put our grounding and they go, okay, mom, I got my monkey's tail hooked up. And so all of a sudden, it's almost like your presence, your awareness becomes anchored. Mm. And like I said before, I think my struggle for the nine months to a year was me getting grounded, me mm -hmm. getting back in my body. When we're anxious, we are, our spirit, our energetic presence is in the future. When we're depressed, we're in the past, or when we're worried, stuck behind us. Mm -hmm. And our challenge is to learn how to be present to be in the moment that's where the power of manifesting comes and that's where we can experience and witness and have miracles that's where healing occurs the more we can be present if we've got pain pain is stuck energy and um whether it's emotional pain or physical pain, it's some energy that's not moving in our system. So I teach people how to clear and remove the energetic blocks in our chakra system, which is the anatomy of our spirit. It's an there are wheels of energy that are spinning, and you don't even have to know what they are. But when and working with the tools and the practices that I teach, those start they work like a rotor rooter, right? And we begin flushing all mm. the crap, <laughs> pardon the pun, um, the crap out of our space. And it's oh, lost in space, <laughs> out of our space and into this realm. So we've got to, that's our job, is to understand that we are spiritual beings having human experience. Yeah, yeah, we are. What about... We've all forgotten. We've all forgotten. Exactly, because we come here with this amnesia and we forget everything that we've ever known. We forget what it's like to, well, most people to have that birth experience. And then we have this life experience. You've been talking about clearing blocks. What about the concept around we come here for life lessons and perhaps we come here for a life of pain? Because that's the lesson, that's the physical experience that we were destined to have. If you want to talk about soul contracts or predetermined life events you're there talking about clearing pain clearing blocks energetic blocks can we clear all of them or are there some blocks which perhaps is part of our life plan and we need to just go through them any thoughts that's a great question never really thought about it like that um i guess it's all relevant to how we interpret the pain Mm, okay. Because you can yep. actually have physical pain and not let it stop you. Mm. And I know myself when I have back pain or over the years I've had, and you just keep going, don't you? Mm. Now we're supposed to slow down and hopefully do something with it. And that's trying to get our attention. I think there's an overlay. I remember a man that was um came to me years ago that was struggling with what was it? Him and a friend. Gosh, I can't. I'm sorry. I had to bring up that story. I can't remember the details well enough. I don't, unless I repeat the story and repeat the story, it comes and then it goes. But all right. I remember when I started clearing him and he goes, oh my God, I've got the very same situation in this lifetime with a friend. And so we repeat the, the sort of the theme. It's not always with one person. It could be. And then once we clear that, 
it opens up space for healing. Now, what does healing look like? I don't always know. I'm not God, right? And I, so it, it could be that you just feel lighter and you feel free from something. Maybe the physical pain remains, maybe not. But all I know is, you know, I've helped people that were on death's door and a, a princess get pregnant. And it's moving those energies that are preventing that which we want. Mm -hmm. So there again, if a person came in with a lifetime of pain, and I, you're not being specific about, did you mean physical pain? Like as in? Oh, it, yeah, well, I was meaning physical pain, but it, actually it could be anything. Emotional, anything. Sometimes I also think it's not for them that they came as a teacher for someone else. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I have a client in London who has a child that I don't know if she has muscular um, dystrophy, I think. And that child is, is to a wheelchair. But, you know, she is so committed to the child. And it was bring you know, to the point where it was becoming debilitating for her and the rest of the family. So they finally were arranged where the child goes and stays at a center where they can care for her for five days and she comes home on the weekends, you know, hmm. because she needed to create that space. But we had to do some some serious clearing and healing for the month, mother hmm. so that she could let herself heal, let hmm. herself have that space rather than that obligation. And it, it's not that she's wants to, you know, throw off the responsibility at all. It's just that we try to create a balance mm. and teaching her how to care for herself too. That was also part of her lesson. Well, it's different for everybody. Every single circumstance, Kirsty, is unique, right? Mm. Through everything you've been through, these amazing experiences, You've gone on to do lots of study and research and you're working with people coaching. You've done a lot since your initial experience. Is there one message or one thing that stands out that you'd really love to leave with people that you'd want people to know? Be all that you can be. And even then, if you think you know who you are or where, where what you're here to achieve, there's more. Mm. You know, the wonder of what's more and what as as we stretch to reach our maximum potential, I don't think we can ever really completely realize that in the human form, but it's a great effort to to strive for. Mm. I love that. As you have been talking, I've had the words just going through my mind quite a few times in this last hour of remember who you are, remember who you are. And it just keeps coming up and it's just jumped in again with what you've just said there. Remember who you are. So I'm going to take that from today and let that kind of just percolate within me. But I feel just such a strong message. I don't know if it's that people need to hear it who are listening, whether it's for me personally, whether it's a general thing, but remember who you are. I'm going to take that for today. Thank you so, so much. You've shared so much with us. Um, amazing experiences. Thank you for joining me. Thank you with all my heart. <laughs>